Okay. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Introduction to Trout Fishing Friday evening webinar series. Uh, I'm Dan Dow, and I'll be your host and moderator of the next three Fridays. And on behalf of Trout Unlimited and Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, I'd like to thank you for just being here with us today. Um, for those of you that may be unfamiliar, both TU and BHA are environmental conservation organizations that do a ton of work to help protect our wildlands and educate the public uh, on their importance. We all know fishing is fun. It's a great healthy activity that gets us outside and in touch with mother nature. And uh, organizations like TU and BHA are important because they form an organized community of folks that are out there uh, doing those outdoor activities, fishing, hunting, things like that. Uh, and those communities are big contributors to conservation. Uh, they are, we are the voice. So many people don't think about that, but it's important to know. Uh, so this special collaboration between TU and BHA came to fruition uh, because we saw a gap in information out there on the internet for new and beginner anglers. Um, there's so much on the internet and it can be impossible for a beginner to kind of know where to start. Uh, we wanted to give you a place to come and learn uh, at the very, very first step. So over the next three Friday evenings, uh, we hope to give you the foundational knowledge that you need to get out there and feel confident that you can successfully catch a trout. Uh, so before we get started, I'd like to give you an overview of the program, kind of what you can expect to learn throughout the next uh, three Fridays. So today, uh, day one is sort of our gearing up day. We're gonna cover some fishing license stuff, talk about your fishing rods and reels, both conventional and fly and, and other gear. And, and I'll cover our agenda for the day uh, in a few moments. Day two, uh, will be next Friday, March, I'm um, sorry, May 21st. And that's all about finding and catching trout. Uh, the biology of trout, some of their habits, their tolerances and abilities. Uh, reading water, rivers and streams versus lakes and still waters. Uh, presentation techniques uh, for both uh, conventional fishing and fly fishing gear. Uh, sort of that's sort of how to kind of get your, your bait or lure over to the fish and, and hopefully catch them. And then once you do catch them, we'll cover some uh, handling best practices for once you get the fish into your net or to hand. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, what to do when you want to keep fish, but also some best practices for catch and release and safely and humanely releasing that fish. And of course, getting a, a nice picture to, to share with your friends and family. And then uh, on day three, May 28th, uh, will be state specific uh, to Colorado and or Pennsylvania areas. Uh, we're gonna have representatives that day from uh, organizations like Pennsylvania Trout Unlimited, uh, Colorado Trout Unlimited, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, of course, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, and also Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, we're gonna cover on that day, the types of water that uh, you're gonna find in your state, again, rivers and streams, also some lakes and still bodies, still water bodies. Uh, we'll share some hot spots in the state, uh, in your regions to, uh, to hopefully give you a little leg up in getting out there and, and maybe a, a good opportunity to find trout. And uh, we'll also dive into some major issues to trout conservation in the state and sort of what, B, uh, what BHA and TU are working on uh, to help protect our cold water fisheries, our access and protect the trout. And then I'd like to wrap up that day with, uh, with a Q&A panel for, uh, for the state with, with, the, um, with the presenters. So again, before we get started, uh, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items here. Uh, for today, I know it's Friday evening uh, and we really appreciate your time. We blocked out about two hours for this event. Um, I don't think we'll necessarily need all of it, but we wanted to make sure that we had enough time at the end of our presentation to answer any questions that the audience may have. Um, also, it's important to note that over these three webinars, uh, like you may have just heard me say, uh, you're gonna hear a lot of talk pertaining to both Colorado and Pennsylvania. That's because this, this event is actually kind of being piloted in the general areas of Colorado and Pennsylvania. And I understand that some of you are outside of the area and that's completely okay. Uh, a lot of the information, almost all of it will be applicable uh, wherever you are. And uh, finally, we don't expect any technical problems during today's program, but in the event that one occurs, just please use the same link that you use to log right back on and and uh, we're gonna resume the program right from where we left off. So before we jump into our big day here, uh, day number one, I'd like to start out with a poll. So you're gonna see a poll question pop up on your screen momentarily. Um, and I'd like to know how many times have you been fishing? 
uh, zero, one to five, six to 10, or more than 10. We'll give everybody a couple seconds to, to jump in and answer that question. Okay, so without further ado, let's talk about today's agenda uh, in a little bit more detail. So first off, uh, we're gonna be speaking about uh, your fishing license and your trout stamp, why they're important, some details surrounding that. Uh, we'll next move into fishing styles, conventional fishing uh, versus fly fishing. We'll have a little bit more conversation about other general gear and, and what you need to kind of get ready to get out there. We'll cover a little bit about your, uh, your common knots that you're gonna need to know. And uh, we'll talk some more about Pennsylvania and Colorado resources um, and wrap it up, hopefully with a Q&A panel and give everybody an opportunity to ask some questions to our panelists. Uh, so speaking of, uh, I'd like to introduce our presenters for the day, uh, Kelly Williams and Emma Brown. So Kelly Williams is a watershed specialist with the Clearfield County Conservation District. Uh, she's a Headwaters RCD Council Treasurer. She's the Allegheny Mountain Chapter of Trout Unlimited board member. She's the co-chair for the Pennsylvania Council of Trout Unlimited Women, Diversity and Inclusion Initiative, the PA Council of Trout Unlimited Northwest Regional Vice President, and she's also a fishing skills instructor with the PA Fish and Boat Commission. Emma Brown is a student at uh, CU Boulder out in Colorado. She's a Lincoln Hill Cares fly fishing instructor. She's a youth coordinator for uh, the organization, the Greenbacks, and she's also a longtime Colorado Trout Unlimited volunteer. And with that, I will let uh, Emma and Kelly take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this. I'm so excited to share uh, what we've created with you guys. Um, so we're going to first talk about uh, the very first step that you need to take if you want to get out onto the water and start fishing for trout. So the very first step anyone has to take is uh, to buy a fishing license. Um, and this ensures that you can fish legally on the water and that you can fish for all species within rules and regulations um, in your state waters, in your local waters. So you can do this by uh, purchasing online um, or at your local outdoors retailer. So like Walmart, Dick Sporting Goods, Cabela's, Bass Pro. Um, that, those are like pretty familiar ones we have in Colorado and both Pennsylvania. Um, so you can purchase them there and they'll print it out for you and you'll keep it on your person. Um, you can also now in Colorado get a digital fishing ID, which is kind of cool. I just downloaded it like yesterday. <laughs> you can keep it on your iPhone, keep it in your pocket. Um, and it's important to keep these IDs on you um, because sometimes you'll have some sort of law enforcement officer kind of just stop when you're out fishing and ask you, hey, are you, uh, do you have a fishing license? Um, and these people in Colorado are called park rangers. And then in Pennsylvania, they're called waterways conservation officers. So just make sure you have those licenses to show proof that you are legally allowed to be on the water. So next, uh, we'll talk about a trout stamp, also known as a habitat stamp here in Colorado. Um, and a little bit of history about what the trout stamp is, is that when you buy a fishing license, um, you'll be asked to purchase this and it's an extra fee. Um, and it ensures that you can fish for all species of trout. So right, the fishing license is for all fish and then the trout stamp is for um, specifically trout. Um, so it used to be, this is a cool fact, it used to be, that on your printed fishing license, they would put this little stamp, just like a, a stamp you put on your mail, like your letters, um, and they put it on the corner of your, your fishing license. They don't do this anymore. Uh, it's just an added fee for your total. So it will come with your fishing license. You don't have to worry about paying or going and finding your trout stamp, um, but it's just a cool little, little fact. And it's important because the money um, that we pay for our fishing licenses goes to some really great uh, programs. And we'll talk about that right uh, after this slide. Sorry, forgot I had myself muted there. Um, okay, so now we know that you need the license. Um, but what does the a little bit more about that is um, Pennsylvania and Colorado are, are very similar in um, 
like uh, what that license gets you and um, how when when it qualifies and all that. So um, in Pennsylvania, uh, you have to have a license if you're 16 or older and you're going to be out fishing. Um, anyone younger than that, you know, if it's you know 15 and younger, uh, you don't need a license and essentially can fish for free. Um, in Pennsylvania, uh, they're valid from December 1st of one year to December 31st of the following year. Um, that can be sound a little confusing. It's almost the calendar year, but it's just one month extra. So uh, you can see here on this slide that we put December 1st, 2020, for example, your license would then be valid all the way through December 31st of 2021. Um, and if you want to learn more about uh, the license, um, the fees and things associated with that, um, you can check that out in um, uh, online, of course, you can just look up the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, but they have a handy app that kind of has all that information pared down and, and kind of easily accessible in an app. Uh, to get that in the iStore or the, you know, for your iPhone or, or Android, you just go and, and look up Fish Boat PA and, and you'll have that. And um, the, the information that we're providing here, yes, it's very state specific to these two states, but I imagine it's, it's similar in the other ones, but you'll have to check in your particular state if you're joining us from somewhere other than PA or Colorado today. So just like Pennsylvania, uh, Colorado is pretty much the same. Um, so if you are 16 and older, you're considered an adult and you have to buy a fishing license if you wanna get, on the, get out on the water. Um, and if you're 16 and younger, you're considered youth um, and fishing is free actually. Um, but all rules and regulations still apply for uh, 16 and under. Um, and the dates for your annual fishing license is April 1st to March 31st of the following year. This is for Colorado. Um, so like for this year, last month on April 1st, we all had to get our new fishing licenses and those licenses will run until next year, 2021, uh, March 31st. So it runs a whole consecutive year. Um, and for more information for Colorado, you can download the fishing regulations brochure, um, like a digital version, or pick it up um, at your local uh, like park ranger station. Um, and then there's also a Colorado Parks and Wildlife app um, for more information, and it will give you all information about where to fish, um, what seasons, rivers are open, how to get there. Uh, it's a really great app, and I highly recommend it. I use it all the time when I go fishing. Um, so yeah. So, oh, this is Kelly's slide. She's gonna talk first. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Uh, so a little bit about the two um, agencies that we're talking about today and the differences between the two states. So Pennsylvania, it can be a little bit confusing um, because we actually have a different agency that deals with all the different types of needs. So for example, um, the Department of Environmental Protection takes care of general environmental regulations. Uh, the Department of, of Conservation and Natural Resources, they're uh, conserving our, our state forests um, and, and uh, like all the uh, parks uh, with, there within. Um, then we also have the Game Commission. Uh, they are responsible for like wild games. So think like deer, bear, turkey, that kind of thing, hunting and the rules and regulations about that uh, uh, associated. Um, and uh, when we're talking fishing, boating, or you know, like our, our uh, amphibians and our reptiles, that responsibility falls on the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. And so when you get a license, it's not just, you know, just a fee put on you, like just to, just to make you pay something. That fee actually is very important. Um, in Pennsylvania, um, we, they are actually a user funded agency, which means that they don't get money from the general fund, like just from the state to support them. They're actually supported by license fees and some taxes on some certain um, uh, equipment. Um, that it, like fishing equipment. Um, so it's very important. That's, that's, you know, that's what user funded means. And what, when we say user funded, like, what does that get you? So protect the mission of the PA Fish and Boat Commission is to protect, conserve, and enhance the Commonwealth's aquatic resources and provide fishing, fishing and boating opportunities. And a lot of people think that the Fish and Boat Commission, they're just concerned, and actually Trout Unlimited as well, that they're just concerned with trout stocking. And that's really just a small part of it. Um, it's a costly part of it, but it's a small part of it. Uh, they really do a whole lot, um, including aquatic habitat restoration and protection. Um, we have over 86,000 miles of waterways in, in 
Pennsylvania alone, and that's a lot to, to maintain and, and improve. Uh, they also do fisheries management and improve or uh, and enforcement. Um, you know, that's just making sure everyone's legal on the water, and you know, it is like treating the fish properly and, and doing all everything according to the rules in, in their their summary book. They also do boating law enforcement, so people who are out, you know, just boating on Pennsylvania lakes, they make sure that they stay safe too, have enough flotation devices, um, that they're registered properly, things like that. Uh, they also do rescue um, and search and rescue. Uh, fishing and boating education is also another big one. That's kind of what um, you saw in my title slide, uh, fishing skills instructor. Um, that's a big part of it. We have a lot of women's introductory classes, um, just introductory classes for anybody, intro to kayak fishing, intro to chop fishing, family fishing days, things like that. So it's also a big part of what they do. And of course, you see there, there's the, the raising and stocking trout, um, which, I mean, that's quite the undertaking for a single agency to take on. And to accomplish all this, they do a lot in-house, but they also partner with a lot of organizations. Um, there's nonprofits, like they do a lot of work with Trout Unlimited, and they also work with uh, conservation districts. That's where, um, that's where I work, <laughs> and I'm, I'm a watershed specialist there, so that means that I get to work on the, the watersheds of Clearfield County, um, but they work with us to do kind of implement, like, the, but particularly the aquatic habitat restoration and protection. So just like Pennsylvania, again, it's a little bit different. We don't have as many agencies overseeing um, fishing and stocking efforts, um, but we have one kind of central agency that oversees all of this, um, and that's Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, and an interesting fact is that federally, by law, all money from fishing licenses goes to wildlife and conservation programs. Um, it's really, really cool, which is why it's so important to get a fishing license because that money goes directly to, say in Colorado, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife and other conservation efforts. So it's a really important ethical way to build funding for conservation. Um, so that's why we talk a lot about it in this uh, day one. Um, so Colorado Parks and Wildlife, uh, oversees statewide operations of fishery and hatchery management. So they oversee all of the hatcheries in Colorado. Um, you'll see their little logo on the signs in front of hatcheries if you've ever been driving past one. Um, and they also partner with nonprofit grassroots organizations like Trout Unlimited and Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and many more, uh, not just uh, with fishing and hunting, but with also uh, hiking, camping, backpacking, all of the recreational sports, I guess to say. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's really cool. Um, yeah. So uh, like I said in the last slide, it's so important to get your fishing license because it's such an important way to get funding and to start being involved in uh, your local conservation um, uh, programs. Um, so our, our overall goal with this is to protect, preserve, enhance, uh, and enhance the sport of fishing today uh, and for generations to come. So now we will go into fishing styles, uh, conventional uh, and fly fishing, and we'll talk about uh, the differences and the basics that you will need to know uh, for trout fishing specifically. Um, and we'll start with conventional fishing, which Kelly will talk about because she's an expert about it. Oh boy, expert. <laughs> Okay, so conventional fishing, um, you're probably actually, if you're, if you're participating in this, you, you've probably at least seen the two different styles of fishing or at least the rods maybe that somebody is holding. And, and that's maybe what brought you in and, and brought, you know, gave you some interest in these two different types of fishing. So first we're gonna talk about conventional. Um, and this involves using a rod and you can see there my niece <laughs> holding the rod um, and that's used to launch your baited hook or lure into the water. Um, the line, you can see in the picture, you can barely see it. That's not just the picture, that's the way the line is. It's very thin um, and almost invisible. Um, you don't want the fish to see it. So you, like that's why it's nearly invisible, of course, to them, um, but we can see it. Um, and in this instance, or in this type of fishing, it's the action of the rod and the weight at the end of the line that propels the bait. So think of it as like those, uh, the top, like if you have a, a dog that you have like the ball tossers that, that throw the ball for them, it's, it's sort of like that motion, throwing the, the bait out into the water. And to go over this, we're going to talk a little bit about the rod, the reel, the line, and the tackle. So of course, the, probably the, I won't say the most important part, but the biggest part maybe is the rod. Um, and it's the used, just as I said before, uh, to propel the bait or lure into the water. 
Um, it also absorbs the tension when you're landing a fish. So if you can imagine just holding like a reel of any style in your hand and trying to reel in a fish, like that would be a little odd. <laughs> and I don't think it would be very effective. So the, this allows you to, um, you know, kind of land the fish. Um, they also come in different lengths. I'm sure if you've ever even, even walked past an aisle that contains uh, the different different rods and different fishing equipment, you'll notice that there's a lot of equipment out there and there's a lot of different sizes of rods. Uh, for Pennsylvania, well, or really anywhere, um, just for trout fishing, uh, they typically go from like the, the, the lengths are five to eight feet is typical. Uh, the shorter they are, uh, the easier it is to get into like tight narrow spaces. So in Pennsylvania, if you're fishing some of our streams, uh, looking for a brook trout, then they're going to be a little tighter. There's going to be a lot more brush and things around. So the shorter rod helps you get in there a little bit better without, you know, like hitting your rod off the ground and breaking the tip or, uh, you know, getting stuck in something very easily. Eight feet, that's usually good for, you know, maybe if you're on a pond or a lake somewhere. They also come uh, in different weights or different actions. And for trout fishing, the best is light or ultra lightweight. And that just means that the rod has a lot of uh, like give in it and, and it's very flexible and it allows you to land and to fight and then land that fish. Um, on the right hand side, you can see a diagram of the basic parts of a rod. Uh, the, at the bottom there is the handle and that's the part that you'll hold. Uh, then there's the reel, that's where it sits. We'll talk about that next. And of course the seat where that reel is attached to the rod. Uh, there's then also, they call the rest of the rod the blank. Uh, and on it, you'll see the little guides or eyelets they're called. That is uh, where the line will go through uh, those eyelets and that just keeps it attached to the rod. Um, otherwise, you know, it would sort of defeat the purpose of having the rod if, if the line didn't stay close to it. And then there's the tip of the rod and that can, um, you know, for beginners, I'll just say that that can be uh, a delicate kind of part of the rod. Not so delicate just when you're using it, but when you're walking and, and trying to get to where you want to fish, you want to be very careful of taking care of the tip of the rod. Um, here you see the picture. That is a picture of the bottom of my rod. And I just wanted to put that in here to show you that when you're fishing for rods, or yeah, fishing for rods, <laughs> looking for rods to fish with, um, it's really about feel. Um, we've given you, like here you have the guidelines of kind of what to look for, but it's really about going in the store, holding them in your hands and feeling what feels comfortable for you with the length um, and, and, the, and the give in it, whether it's light or ultralight. Uh, once you have that rod, it kind of helps set you up for the next gear that you're going to get. So here you see on the bottom of my rod, it's a five foot rod um, and the action is ultralight which is really, it's really fun rod to fish with. And it says that it'll take about two to six pounds, uh, two to six pound line. So it's already telling us what kind of line will work best with that rod. And we'll get a little bit more into the line here next. So the, the next important part, um, if you recall in that diagram was the reel. Um, you're not hand fishing, you're not bringing these, these guys in with a line uh, with your hands. Um, you actually, the, the rod, or I'm sorry, the reel, you're gonna wind them in, you see the handles on both rods there. Um, you use that to retrieve the line and retrieve your fish. Uh, the nice thing about uh, these types of uh, reels, they have what's called a drag system. And this drag system acts as kind of like a break uh, when you're playing the fish. So when you get a bite, if you didn't have any drag uh, in your reel or on in your reel, or you had it turned way low, then the fish, when they take the, the lure or the bait, they could just run with it because there's really nothing to stop them but you. So they can really take that line right off the reel fast. And, and trout especially, like they can be really fast fish. Um, so, but, so if you're able to turn the drag up so there's a little bit more braking power on it, it doesn't let that fish take off quite as much. And it helps you uh, be able to, you know, quote unquote, fight that fish and bring the fish in. Uh, there's two basic types of uh, styles, I should say, of reels. And they're both pictured here. Um, the top right one is the one that I fish with now. Uh, it is an open-faced reel. And you can see there in the picture that it's held, um, or it's attached, I should say, to the bottom of the rod and you fish with it down like that, uh, like with a reel on the bottom. And you kind of just give your hand rod a, a handshake. And this one is, you use this one, like you control the line with your finger. You can see there, I have a line in my finger. Um, between that, that's how you cast with it. Um, the bale, um, right there, which is just underneath my hand there, that's where the line is attached and you can see the reel. Um, this one is a right-handed rod or right-handed reel 
but I reel with my left hand because I want to control it with my right hand. Um, it's very easy when you have these actually in your hand to, to kind of get the feel for them. Uh, the other style is the closed face. And this one is more, I said, I'll say beginner friendly, like true beginner friendly. Um, it's held or used like that on top of the rod. And again, this is also a right-handed rod. So you typically hold it and reel with your right because it gives you just a little bit more control of the handle. Uh, there's, I, my finger is on a, on a button and you press that button. And when you cast it, that's what allows the, the line to fly off. Um, we could have a whole night talking about just, you know, casting techniques and, and ways to use these two different styles. But for tonight, just to give you an idea of, of the, the different styles and the different kinds of gear that you can have, I just wanted to do a quick overview. Um, the difference between the two, as far as, you know, which one you might want to pick, uh, the closed faced, it tends to, um, tangle less. Um, this is the first kind of rod that I started with. It's a closed faced reel. It's just the, the line doesn't, like it can't just come off super easily. Um, it's contained inside there in that cap. And if you're looking up at the right hand side, the one that's um, an open face, once you um, get ready to cast it, that line can uh, come off of the reel, um, off the bale we'll say, and it, and it can get tangled easily. Um, it happens to me. I mean, I'm a call me professional. Believe me, I still have moments like that where, where things get tangled. Um, so, you know, if, if you're just worried about that, you can always start with a closed face and work your way up to an open-faced reel. And so the reel, um, it holds the line. Um, the line is just a thin strand of monofilament, which is a type of plastic. And again, if you've ever been near a store where and just looked at the different types of um, uh, monofilament out there, there's a ton in all different rates and all different styles and, and they even tinted different colors and that's just you know the, the the thinking is like the different colors like you know blending in better so fish don't see it and the best thing that I can say like to, to get you started is again you really just sort of have to try them out um of course they're all different costs as well so you can sort of let that guide you as well and again go back to the rod and it's written on like right near the handle of the rod and it'll say like this rod can handle, well, not in so many words, but it'll say like two to six pounds, like my rod did. And for trout, uh, you typically wanna go for two pound, two to eight pound test. And what that means when, it, when I say test, that is the breaking strength of it. So if you like imagine like wrapping it around your fingers and pulling, that's the breaking strength. And so really thin line, like the, the two pound test that breaks very easily, that doesn't have a lot of memory in it, which means that it doesn't remember being on the reel. So it won't stay wound. Just like when you're curling your hair and it's like, it, it holds that curl. Um, and then there are some folks who curl your hair and it's, it doesn't stay that way. So imagine the two pound is like, if you try to curl your hair, but the, the curl doesn't say, it doesn't remember that. Um, the eight pound test is a little tougher. It won't break as easily. So fish, you know, pulling on it might not break it as quickly. Um, but it, it remembers, <laughs> it remembers being around the, the reel. So it'll look, sometimes it'll be, you know, curly and, and tight on there. So, so you just sort of have to balance, but, but two to eight pound test is great. Um, I think right now on my rod, I think it's eight pound test that I have. It's, it's really good. And, and when I say break, I don't mean that like, you know, like every fish you catch is going to break off. Um, it, it handles well. It's just a matter of, you know, like sometimes you can get a really big, large fish that you're not expecting and, and it breaks. But again, that's, I mean, that's fishing, <laughs> unfortunately, but, um, so, but yeah, it's not too bad or too bit too bad. There, there's a lot of choices out there, but, but for today's purposes, that's good. So we'll go keep going ahead to what you use to actually catch the fish, the bait or the lure on the end of your line and uh, conventional fishing, sometimes called bait casting because you're casting bait out into the water. And you see here, I just have some, uh, night crawlers there in a bin that that's the live weight that I live bait that I typically use. Um, so fishing with live bait means you have a worm or a night crawler or a minnow even for some different types of trout on the end of your line that's attached to a hook, which is typically fished under a bobber. And you can see my, my little drawing there to kind of give you an idea of what that looks like, the line going to the bobber and, and then so on and so forth. Um, the little dot there in the middle is what we call a split shot weight. Um, and that's exactly what it sounds like. It gives it some weight. Because remember, conventional fishing is all about the rod casting a weighted line out into the water. So sometimes the weight of the, the bait is enough, but sometimes you have to have a little extra weight on there. Um, you can fish worms without the bobber, but I'll leave stuff like that, like the techniques for next week, um, so they can go a lot more in depth. Um, 
uh, the, uh, when you're fishing with the live bait, uh, it gets left in the water. Um, but again, that's, they'll go into details of that like next week. Um, and then the important part at the end is the barbed hooks. Uh, there's two types of hooks that you can use. I mean, they come in many different other styles and, and different, um, you know, they come from different companies who, who make them and, and that's that type of thing. Uh, barbed, fish, barbed hooks are typically what you use if you're looking to keep the fish that you're catching, like if you're gonna eat them. Uh, they have actual barbs on them. You can see the two hooks there um, on the screen and you can see the difference between them on the very tip of, the, of the, the sharp point that actually catches the fish. The one on the left does not have a barb and the one on the right does have a barb. And the, the whole point of having that is to make sure that the fish stays on there, um, just a little extra secure. But barbless, as you can see, does not have that barb. And it, it, it's really fine to catch fish with either. I mean, it's, it's more humane if you're going to release them and, and, and easier to release them if you use the barbless hook. Um, so, and it's really kind of a matter of like what type of fishing you're doing. I like to do a lot of catch and release. So I have a lot of barbless hooks. Now, if you end up buying barbed hooks on accident and you wanna release fish and, and you wanna you know, get rid of those barbs, you can do that um, with, if you've already purchased them, you can either file that little uh, barb down so that it's not gonna you know, catch the fish, or I'm sorry, like hold on to the fish tightly. It's, it's a lot easier to, to release them or you can crimp it with some pliers. Um, so it's, re it's really easy to do. I, I do that all the time. Um, but again, they do sell barbless hooks that you can buy. And if you're not using live bait, the other typical uh, use or other, other typical thing you use is a lure on the end of your line. And I just have one picture here, but again, there's many different styles of uh, spinners and, and spoons that can be used for trout. And these are fished on the end of the line without a bobber or a weight because these have both a hook on them already and they're usually pretty weighty. Like you don't have to worry about having extra weight typically if you're fishing these. And you cast these and then you bring them right back in as opposed to of course bait that you wanna leave out there until uh, the fish are able to find it. And so, it, I know there seems like there could be a lot more to this and there is as far as fishing style, like how you utilize these, um, but we're gonna leave that for uh, next week's presentation. They're gonna go into that a little bit more in depth. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the beloved fly fishing. Um, so we tried to keep it really basic um, and so, which was, which was hard. Um, and I don't know how many of you guys, uh, fly fish, but we'll go through, um, uh, like five, four different, um, sections about how to get started, uh, with a fly rod, with your fly line, with your flies, and then some miscellaneous items that are helpful for you out on the water. Um, so just a little introduction into fly fishing. Um, so obviously the rod looks different, way different than conventional fishing. Um, so right here on the right, we have our, our nice fly rod with our reel. Um, and the primary difference of fly fishing is that the line is weighted. Um, we're not casting a weighted, um, or we're not relying on a, on a, on a weighted lure or bait. Um, uh, we do fish with weights, um, but we cast in a different way to cast our weighted line out towards our fish. Um, so I'm assuming that uh, most of you have seen a fly fisherman out on the water or pictures of anglers and their big, beautiful casts where it makes a big loop or a J in the air. And what that is, is that the angler is loading the weight into their rod um, and catching that energy to throw it out and have your line uncurl onto the water with your fly attached to the end of it. Um, so it requires obviously a little bit of different casting than conventional fishing. Um, so we'll talk about that and we'll learn a little bit more about how you can get, uh, get these things to start fly fishing. So let's talk fly rods. So when you walk into a store and you say, I wanna get into fly fishing, um, the first thing you're gonna probably do is look at fly rods. Um, they're categorized in different weights. Um, so for trout fishing uh, on fresh water, uh, the typical setup is a two weight to a five weight. You can fish different weights um, higher than a five weight, but I would say that's pretty recommended uh, for here in Colorado on our streams and then also in uh, Pennsylvania as well. Um, so anything from a two eight to a five weight, sometimes six weight. Um, and the typical length of it is eight and a half to nine foot length. My rod is nine feet. Um, it's a five weight. 
Um, and this is pretty typical. Uh, we also have saltwater fly fishing rods, um, just like conventional has saltwater fishing rods as well. Um, but we're sticking to trout fishing on freshwater today. Um, our reel um, holds our line and our backing. So the colored part of our line, um, it holds all of that extra distance um, in, in, the, in the reel and in the spool. And that comes out so you can load up more, more line or new line, I guess to say, um, and do maintenance on your reel. Um, and an angler typically relies on their, on their reel um, to control how much or how little of that line to cast. What they do is they hold uh, the rod handle and then they use their left hand with a little bit of extra line to feed into their rod when they're casting. And they'll talk a lot about this in day two and then get into the specifics of how to actually cast a fly rod. So this gets complicated. So pay attention, everyone. I can't, I'm, I'm gonna try to keep it really basic, um, but we have uh, different sections to our fly line on our rod. Um, so we're gonna start with our line. Like I said, it's the colored part. So right here on the right, I have a picture of our fly line. It comes in a little box that you can get at a really any outdoor store, um, outdoor retailer store. Um, another picture of all our fly lines. Um, they have a lot of distance to it. Um, so that's what will be in your reel. Um, and then it goes into our leader. So our fly line to our leader. The leader is a clear part of the line um, that gets thinner and tapered towards the end. So it starts from thick to th and it goes to thin. Um, and so that's the clear part. It's in a little bag here. It's a tapered leader. Most of them are tapered. You tie it to your line. And then our last part is our tippet. Um, the tippet is the thinnest piece of monofilament line. Um, and it's used to tie to your fly so that you don't disturb the presentation of your fly on the water. Um, it comes in different sizes. So uh, the best way I can explain this of why we have different sizes of tippet is that when we have our one liter attached to our fly line, um, sometimes we tie on a fly, cut it off, um, or if we have two, ties, two flies attached to our liter um, at the tapered end, we'll cut different sections down. And over time, it, it tends to get shorter because um, we keep cutting sections off to tie on our flies. Um, so we have tippet, we have tippet. Um, it's that thin line um, that the trout can't see really if you get down to the, to the thinnest sizes. Um, and that's what we attach our fly to. Um, the different sizes range from one X to seven X. Um, typically it's like two X to six X. That's what I have on my setup. Um, but one X is the thickest. So it's, it's pretty thick, it's like your leader. Um, and then 7x and 6x, the, the larger the numbers are, is the smaller the line. Um, so kind of counterintuitive, but just remember that the smaller the number for your tippet, the thicker the line is. So you wanna try to have a larger number at the end attached to your fly. So you wanna have like 5x, 6x, sometimes 7x attached to your fly. So to tie this all together, there's this cool little diagram. So this is our full fly rod setup. Um, we have our fly reel and line in our rod um, right here on the, on the left. Um, and this goes all the way up our, our long rod and uh, like, conventional, like a conventional setup, we have um, eyelets or guides and this is where our line sneaks through to the end of the rod. Um, then we have our fly line, the colored part, that's also part of our reel, goes all the way out to the end. Um, then it is attached to our fly leader um, that's that clear part. Remember the, the, the clear tapered part. Um, and then we have our tippet after our fly leader. Um, and then attached to the tippet is our fly. So kind of a cool little setup. Uh, hopefully that kind of ties it all together for you guys to understand kind of what's happening. Oh. Okay, so fly basics. <laughs> Again, I'm trying to keep this very simple. Um, they will get more into this next week. Um, but breaking down flies uh, in fly fishing, we imitate or we create flies that are artificial and they imitate different life cycles and different types or species of insects um, in the water. Those insects are trout food. Um, so when we present our fly right on the water, the trout will think it's food, will come up and snag it and that's how you catch your fish or hook your fish. So with our flies, we have two basic types um, that we're gonna go over today. That's our dry fly and our wet fly. So let's start with dry fly. 
So I like to think of the dry fly as a surface fly. Um, so when we have a dry fly on the end of our line, it's mimicking anything that's like flying around above the surface of the water. Um, so think grasshoppers, uh, mosquitoes, like any type of flying insect up in the air. Um, and sometimes you can see them hatching on the river. Um, and that's when a lot of flies are flying around in the air. Um, and uh, then we have our wet fly. So I think of this as a subsurface or below surface fly or insect. So it's any insect that's emerged in the water um, or on the rocks in the river um, or floating through the current. So think eggs, worms, larva, um, midges, nymphs, that's what we like to call it, um, or even small bait fish. Trout are carnivorous, they like to eat uh, smaller fish. So you could even have a fish, uh, artificial, artificially tied fly that mimics a fish, a tiny fish. Um, so right here um, on the right, I have a couple pictures. So on the top, I have a life cycle, the very basic life cycle um, of an insect. And anglers like to, like to tend to get pretty nerdy with uh, their, their different uh, entomology, it's called. It's like the life cycles of, of, of the insects on the river. Um, so we start out with our subsurface fly. So these are like our, our baby larvas, our nymphs. Um, and then we move to our midges. This is kind of a more of a teenager aged insect, I guess to say growing up um, and they might be floating around off the rocks. Um, they're not lodged as larva onto the rocks in the river. Still subsurface though, so they're still a wet fly. Um, and then we have our um, adult midges. So that's uh, an adult fly. Maybe they emerge out of the water and fly away, um, but they have wings. So they are above the surface of the water. So we would tend to call that a dry fly. Um, below that graphic is just a different examples of wet fly versus dry fly. So right, we have our eggs, we have our fish, uh, like streamers we call it. Um, we have our worms, um, we have some small midges, and then on the right we have our dry fly. Um, that top fly I love to use, it's called a chubby. It imitates really any like super thick uh, grasshopper kind of type of insect um, or water skater. Um, and then we have other types of dry flies. So that's your very basic uh, introduction to, to flies, uh, dry fly versus wet fly. So wanted to add this in. Uh, there's some other tools that are specific to fly fishing um, that you should probably have on yourself, either if it's in your bag or on a lanyard kind of thing to have uh, ready to use um, when you're out on the river. So I recommend nippers. These are little, uh, little like, they look like nail clippers. It's on the on the top left of the slide, um, but they trim your tippet. Uh, they cut it, and it also helps to cut the little uh, tail end when you're tying it to flies. Super helpful thing to have. Don't recommend using your teeth. Uh, it's a good way to like mess up your teeth. <laughs> um, then we have our hemostats. Uh, some people think these are like forceps for like surgery or something. They're similar. Um, so they hold flies. Um, and they take flies properly out of the trout's mouth. It's a helpful tool. You can stick it right into the trout and get that, that hook out. Um, really helpful thing. You can also crimp the barbs like, like Kelly was talking about. You can pinch the barbs of your hook if you're doing catch and release. Uh, next you have a silicone or dry fly powder. So the silicone is this yellow thing. Um, it's by Loon Outdoors. That's the most common type. Um, and then we have our our uh, dry powder, our dry fly powder. Um, and what both of these things do is that they just keep your fly, uh, I guess like uh, waterproof kind of almost. It helps it float on the water um, and keep the presentation and the form of your dry fly uh, more full and um, it floats on the water. And then I also recommend different sizes of tippet. So right, like we, I talked about how over time your, your leader gets cut off more and more and more and shorter. And um, so it might be helpful to carry um, extra leaders. And on top of that, um, you wanna carry little rolls of tippet. Um, so I, I carry, what did I say? I think I carry like 3X to 5X um, or 3X to 6X. Um, and that just helps me tie on flies or if I have multiple flies on the line, then I can have um, the right amount of tippet um, on my fly line. So lots of information. I hope that was uh, pretty informative for you guys though. Good to know.
So ultimately, each fishing style is a really great way to get out um, and fish for trout um, and get outdoors and start to get involved um, in your local water and your local conservation organizations. Um, and so moving forward, keep that in mind, the conservation message that we're pushing. Um, that's what we want you guys to get involved with and have a good time with fishing. Um, so before we move into more general gear, I think we're gonna do a poll um, and Kelly has the question for you guys um, before we move forward. Okay, so this poll is gonna be, now that you've seen a presentation that gave a little bit of information about both styles of fishing, what style are you most likely to try? Okay, so now we're gonna talk about uh, general gear, knots, and some more resources for you guys to get involved uh, on the water and fishing. Um, so let's start with uh, general gear. So this gear is something that you can use for both conventional and fly fishing. Um, so kind of think like, what else should I bring if I'm prepping to go fishing on the weekend, right? Today's Friday, I wanna go fishing tomorrow. What should I think about bringing um, and how do I do that? So first thing, always carry your fishing license on yourself. Um, have that handy because you never know when you might get stopped or uh, have to show it to get into like a national park or something. Um, and one thing that Kelly and I wanted to make pretty clear with this gear and with both types of fishing is that it can get as expensive as you guys would like, but it really doesn't have to be. There are ways that you can keep it pretty cheap. I'm a student. I like to keep my fishing gear pretty cheap because I don't have all the money in the world. Um, and so it, it really is up to you on what gear you want to spend your money on. Um, so specific types of gear that will work for both. Waiters and the waiting staff. Um, for both types of fishing, um, you want to probably have waders. It's a good investment. It keeps you warm. It keeps you dry, especially when you're on those uh, high like mountain trout streams um, or trekking through um, somewhere where the weather could change really quickly. Um, we also talk, wanted to mention uh, a waiting staff. Um, this is kind of like a safety tip. Um, we don't tend to go out into fast moving water above our knees um, or deep water like that. That's just not really safe. Um, and we want to be as safe as we can when we are fishing. Um, but a wading staff can really help when you're out trekking around in the slippery rocks um, in the water. It can really, really help. And you can buy wading staffs like Orvis and other types of fishing companies have wading staffs. But I usually just use a hiking pole it works just as well, or a stick. I've used a stick before. Um, so also footwear. Um, you wanna have the appropriate footwear um, with your, so if you're wearing waders, you probably wanna have fishing boots because with waders, it makes your, uh, your, your boot kind of like a size bigger because it's so thick. Uh, that neoprene fabric is so thick that you wanna have the right boots for it, especially if you are uh, walking around in the water all day. Um, and so those wading boots have this nice tread on the, on the, on the bottom. You can get um, different tread for it, like to apply to it. Um, and then sometimes they have felt uh, boots as well. Um, I would just recommend try to get what works for you. Um, try to get whatever works for the terrain that you'll be fishing on. Um, and then also if you're wet waiting, if it's the summer, like you're in Colorado or Pennsylvania and it's nice and hot out and you want to get in the, in the water, um, probably not flip flops. You could try that, but maybe like Keens or Tevas, you know, something that you can strap on your feet and, and hike around in the water with. Um, you can also just fish from the bank too, if you don't want to invest in that as well. But just be safe. That's a, that was our main message with, with that. 
Um, also a vest or a backpack or some sort of pack to carry your gear um, because you, you, you want your gear to be easily accessible when you're in the water. I can't tell you how many times I've like gotten stuck on a tree or like a fish took my fly and I need to like I'm standing in the river and need to like switch around, take some tippet, like tie on everything and I'm in the middle of a river. So keep it accessible to your person, um, make it work for you. There's no one right setup, it's whatever works for you. Um, sometimes, well actually, usually most of the time I just wear a backpack. Um, so it, again, like it can get as expensive as you want it to be, but I just use like, a backpack from Walmart. Um, it works. So now we want to have a tackle box. That's the next thing. Um, you want to organize your flies, um, right, to be accessible, but also to just keep track of everything. Flies and lures and bait can get really confusing. They're all different colors. They're tiny. It's all sharp. Uh, try to have it in a box that you can keep contained um, and organized for you. So the next thing is layers hat, sunglasses, um, and the correct clothing for wherever you're going. Um, just like any outing, like hiking, camping, backpacking, you want to have the right stuff and just, just try to be prepared. Um, especially if you're in Colorado, like the weather changes really fast. Um, probably the same for Pennsylvania, I'm assuming when you're out on the water, the weather just likes to change. Um, and then last but not least, try to have a net. Um, so keep nets easily accessible to you. Um, you never know when you're going to snag that lifetime dream fish of yours and you want to take a picture um, or just see how beautiful it is um, and, and reel it in and catch it. So try to try to get a net. There's all different types of nets. They range in prices. Um, you can look it up. Cabela's has a pretty cheap net for like 30 bucks um, and it's a rubber net. But my rule of thumb is that to just just to make sure that it has a sizable width and depth for the fish um, to handle it safely. We'll talk about this uh, next week too, more in depth. Okay, so knots. This part can be a little bit confusing because it's really easiest to learn how to tie some of these knots by seeing someone do it. So it's a little hard for it to come across on our presentation tonight because that, like I said, that could take us maybe another hour just to sit here and show you how to tie some of these knots. Um, but there are really good resources online that are really easy to find. Um, so you see here we have up there uh, animated knots, Berkeley Knot Tying, or the Orvis Fly Fishing Learning Center are all really great resources. And what's nice about these different sites is that, uh, especially the, the animated knots, it's called animated knots for a reason. They actually show you a video of these knots coming together. So somebody tying them and, and there's no one in the way. It's clearly just, you know, how to tie the knot. Um, and they have all kinds of uh, knots for different, not, not only different uh, activities, like they have fishing, boating and, and other things, but um, also like the fly fishing knots that you need. Uh, and so we here, have here um, just a couple of the basic ones that you're gonna use all the time. So for uh, conventional fishing, the improved clinch knot is really, if I had to say there's one, one that you had to learn for, for that, it would be the improved clinch knot. Uh, this is what you're going to use to tie on um, your hooks. There are swivels that attach to, to, attach to lures because they move around so much. They have to have a swivel that allows them to freely move. You will almost always use an improved clinch knot and it works really well and it's really easy to tie. Uh, when you start talking fly fishing, there's a whole bunch of different other kinds of knots that you can deal with because you're dealing with um, the fly line to the tippet or, or the fly line to the leader to the tippet. And, you know, there's different ways to tie all of those on and, then, and even tying it on to the, to the backing, like so that it, it stays on the reel. Um, but again, those are like the nail knot, the blood knot and the surgeon's knot here. But there's all different styles that you can use. But I definitely recommend uh, to start learning how to do this. Check out these resources and then you can even practice with rope. Um, just learn how to do some of these. So you can get like a, like a bolt that just has an eye, like an eyelet, and you can use that. You can use um, hooks if you want, just to practice on something that's actually the size of what you're going to be fishing with. Um, but really, practice makes perfect. So just the more you try it, the, the better you'll be at it. And so why are we here today? Um, and why are we giving this presentation now? Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about ways that you can get on the water now, especially if this really is your, your, you're just getting started right now. Maybe you don't have a license yet and you're thinking about getting one after listening to our presentation. Um, 
in Pennsylvania specifically, and I'll leave Emma to talk about Colorado, of course, but Pennsylvania specifically, um, the Fish and Boat Commission has what they call fish for free days, which is exactly what it sounds like. It means that you're able to fish even if you don't have a fishing license. Uh, it allows people to get out and try it and, and just see how it goes. Uh, and uh, this year, those are on, sun they're both Sundays. It's May 30th and July 4th. So if you wanna try fishing, but you're not sure yet if you want the commitment of getting that license and you just wanna try it out, you can try it on these days. Um, and even though you don't need your license or, or on these just these two specific days, you do have to follow all the other rules and regulations. So you can check those out, like I said, on the app or online on their, on their website. Um, they also have summary books. And you can, if you um, want, uh, and, and you don't necessarily want to fish, but you, you don't have the, the equipment yet, and you're not sure if you want to buy it either. There's also what are called fishing tackle loaner sites in Pennsylvania. So you can go on the uh, Fish and Boat Commission website, and you re really just Google Fish and Boat Fishing Tackle Loaner, and it brings up a map that shows you all these sites that the Fish and Boat has worked with partners to stockpile just little, just like maybe eight rods, sitting at a site where they loan them out and it has the gear along with it has the rods and you just call them up and and you know say I'd like to rent it for this weekend and you're allowed and it's free um because it's it's a resource that we just want to get people out on the water and and I can vouch for it I'm also maintained one of the fishing tackle loaner sites in Clearfield and Central PA and it's you know it's just a really good resource So for Colorado, uh, CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, um, is doing a similar thing uh, like Pennsylvania uh, Fish and Boat Commission. So uh, they have a free fishing weekend. It's coming up next month, June 5th and June 6th. So it's the first weekend of the month. Um, and it's it's a free fishing weekend. So you don't need a license or a habitat, habitat stamp. Um, so it's free. Um, but all other rules and regulations will apply. So if you're interested in that, I highly recommend uh, downloading that uh, regulations brochure. Um, also, um, we don't necessarily have gear loaner sites. We do have different uh, organizations who have um, the same thing, which is uh, discounted gear. They can uh, loan you gear and they can even give you gear. Um, so I know that the Greenbacks does uh, work like this. Cabela does Cabela's <laughs> Cabela Cabela's does a, a loaner um, loans gear out to people. Um, and then also Colorado Park Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, does so many intro uh, like one on one um, fishing days uh, where they'll have instructors out working with people if you sign up for it and it's free because um, they also really want to get people out on the water. So CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife's website um, has more information about that if you are thinking about wanting to get more involved than just this free fishing weekend. Um, but get out on the water, June 5th and June 6th, um, 2021, coming up. Um, so in conclusion of our whole presentation, um, our main goal is to really push you guys and get you excited um, and, and, and give you the tools to get out on the water because fishing and outdoor recreation ultimately leads to caring about conservation of your state land and of your um, local waters. Um, so it will really, really, really be um, kind of the best way to get people involved in those groups um, and to also get something out of it too. Right, you can share this with friends, family, um, and just have a great time in the outdoors. It can be, it's kind of like your own little awesome superpower to get outdoors and, and do something fun. Um, so now we are gonna move into our Q&A panel and I think Dan is gonna talk about that. Um, but thank you so much. I know Kelly and I were super stoked to present all of our slides to you guys. Um, this was such a cool opportunity for me personally. Um, so thank you, thank you very much. I really, really appreciate it. Yes, thank you for being here tonight. Okay, thank you, Kelly and Emma, that was great. Um, so before we hop into our Q&A panel, actually, I would like to do one more poll question from everybody. Uh, and this is just kind of a wrap up. Having seen this presentation, how likely are you to get out fishing in the near future? We'll give you all a couple seconds to uh, mark in your answers there and hit submit.
Okay. So we have a few questions here uh, that have come in. And um, while this is going on, please feel free. If you have any questions, send them into the chat to the panelists um, and we'll do our best uh, to get to them and answer them. Uh, first for, uh, for Emma and Kelly, uh, what's an ideal setup for conventional gear and fly gear? So I guess both of you could, uh, could take a stab at this one at a time. What would be, if somebody had to go and, and make a purchase tomorrow to go fishing tomorrow afternoon, what would be the ideal setup for them? Sure, absolutely. Um, so if you were wanting to go out tomorrow, obviously there's so many different choices out there that it can almost be overwhelming, but there's this cool um, thing that, that I guess, marketing <laughs> technique, I guess that's been used. Um, there are these kits that are sort of pre-arranged that have a rod with a reel attached and they also have the line on them. So it's sort of like ready to go. And these kits will also have um, some lures in there that you can use and sometimes come with a tackle box. So if you want to go out tomorrow without having to you know, spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out what should go with what, especially in conventional fishing, um, you can get these at like you know, Walmart, Stick Sporting Goods, Cabela's, um, probably even like local bait shops have them. And that would be my recommendation for, for conventional. Yeah, for fly fishing, <laughs> Um, I, I love this question because uh, like conventional, they also have kits. So at Cabela's or Dick Sporting Goods, you can get a five weight, like your typical trout fishing rod in a lovely package. And it comes in like a, a rod case um, and it's um, cut into, not cut, it's in four sections, um, but it also already has your reel on it with line inside of it. And it usually comes with some some flies that you can start with. And that I think is uh, probably like less than $150. Um, really great investment. Like that whole thing is less than 150. I broke my rod last summer, uh, actually two years ago. Ugh, I don't know if I should be saying this, but I broke my rod um, a couple summers ago. And then I went to Cabela's and got this rod kit. And I have only been using that from now on because um, it was cheap. It works so well. Um, it's a really quality rod. Um, it was the Temple Fork Outfitters uh, package set up. Um, super great, highly recommend, um, but they have all different options at your local retailer or online too. Online, you can also get that, so yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna throw one in here real quick, not a question, but I think just a, a, a comment or idea that came through uh, that I think was a great point. Um, if you're new to fly fishing, uh, there's often local fly fishing clubs um, where you are, and those can be a really great resource uh, for casting lessons, not classes, et cetera. Um, also your local uh, TU chapter, also your local uh, BHA chapter uh, are gonna have folks that are, that are always willing to, to share experience. So they're just another reason to, uh, to join both of our, uh, our organizations, uh, lots of great resources. Um, thank you, Bill, for sending that in. Um, next question, um, do I have to wear my license on my hat or my back? Um, well, in Pennsylvania recently for a long time, um, up, up until maybe just a year or two ago, you did have to have it, um, at a display, they say, they called it, um, that way nobody even had to ask you if you had it on you. Um, they could just see it either on your hat or on your vest. Um, but recently they did make it so that you didn't have to display it. So you, as long as you have it on you, on your person, you know, in your wallet or in your pack, just so long as it's there in case somebody asks you in Pennsylvania, that's the way it is. Now, if you're not in Pennsylvania or Colorado, of course, um, you know, you might want to, you have to double check <laughs> in your state to be sure. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'll actually take this one. Um, someone asked, would this information also apply in New Jersey? Now, regarding the scope of this whole entire program, um, a lot of the, the gear and, and recommendations for gear, whether it's conventional or fly gear, will absolutely work in New Jersey. Um, this will be a running theme throughout and you've heard um, Emma and Kelly speak about this already, but make sure you check your regulations for your own state as far as uh, those specific rules uh, and, and laws apply. Um, that's probably the most important part, but any of the general information and, and there's all kinds of types of water in both Pennsylvania and New Jersey, Colorado, all across the country. So most of it's applicable. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, 
and I think Kelly, this one's going to be for you. We might dig a little bit more into this uh, next week, but when should I use live bait versus lures? So Kelly, I guess this is a little bit more of a uh, an opinion an opinion question of what what do you think? And we'll like I said, we'll dig into this a little bit more next week too. Okay, boy. Um, well, if you're going for um, like stocked fish, especially, well, not especially, I guess I shouldn't say this, just like our season starts in, well, it's, the, the date varies, but it's always sometime in April um, for in Pennsylvania for, for the stock trout. Um, so really using anything at that time will work because the stock trout are really out there looking for, you know, you have to picture that they've been in, um, you know, in, in a hatchery and they're really just looking to eat. That's what they're looking for. So anything you can throw out there that looks like like food to them. So if I had to say like those times a year, like early in the season, um, especially if you're fishing like at a lake or, you know, you're not maybe up in like the headwaters area specifically targeting like our state's native trout, the brook trout, uh, the bait probably, live bait will work because um, you're mimicking food that they're looking for. So maybe a better way to answer this is kind of just explaining what the two different are, are, are doing. Um, the bait is to mimic like what's naturally in the stream or in the water that the fish is going to eat. So it's, you're, you're mimicking like aquatic worms. So in those instances where you think you're living or fishing in like a lively stream that, you know, maybe has a lot of aquatic life in it, um, you know, and you're, and maybe it's like a little bit more um, like that might be what the fish are targeting. That would be when you use live bait because you're not not fly fishing per se, but you're really mimicking what they're going to be eating there. Um, and I also find that it works great in uh, in lakes because uh, they do stock lakes here in PA, and that's typically what I use. Um, but then the lures, the whole idea behind the lure is for them to create enough noise and enough action that trout are looking for them for, it's like the action and the sound of it that make the trout bite. So the trout will go for those like almost like they're going for say like a an injured fish or, or a fish that they're going to eat, like a minnow that's in the water. So um, rainbows are, are something that's stocked a lot in PA. And I think people like enjoy catching them, just they get kind of bigger and they're, they have a lot of fight in them. Um, they'll attack lures like that pretty readily. Um, so it's really just kind of, like, I think you knew this when you asked it, it's kind of situational um, and, and, on, and honestly based on preference and sort of where you're at. But I don't know, I, I do tend to just sort of go to live bait a lot. I don't know. I feel like I just have better luck with it. I guess I could say. <laughs> Great. That's awesome, Kelly. Um, let's see. This is a good one, I think, to, to dig a little bit deeper in. And it's going to go back to our, our conversation about gear. So um, someone wants to know a little bit more about safety tips for gear for the river um, and, and what we can spe specifically recommend. Um, Kelly or Emma, you can feel free to jump in. And I, I might jump in here with you too a little bit, but. Yeah, so for safety, uh, Emma touched on it. And I would say um, whether it's being my job or fishing is honestly the waiting staff. Um, I'm only five foot two. So when you're talking about getting out there, like you're actually going in the water and it, it doesn't take a lot of water, like, like probably up to your knees is about the farthest that I, you could safely go. Um, any deeper than that, it starts to get faster. Um, but having that waiting staff just gives you a little extra, like, like a third leg, like a, like a tripod, like you're, like it's there to help you balance and, and help, like, help you fight the force of the water and kind of keep you upright. So it's just, I think it's one of those things, especially if you're just getting started, um, kind of a, a really useful thing. And again, you can buy a, like, uh, you know, like a special one that's actually a waiting staff, or you can just get, for the longest time, I just used a hiking hiking pole, <laughs> just like Emma said. Um, so I, that would probably be my, my recommendation. I, one good safety thing that I use a lot, which might just be me, um, but I have a walkie talkie because when I go out with my friends, um, we tend to split up. Um, and sometimes it's hard to like find each other again. Usually it's like we meet at the trailhead or something, but sometimes we can get pretty far away from each other. So it's nice to radio into your friend. I don't know if that's like just me being nerdy, but it's always worked really well um, here in Colorado for me. Um, I know another thing that Dan was talking about was uh, the inflatable kind of setup that is kind of like a life jacket. Um, Dan, can you talk a little bit more about this? Cause I'm not very sure. familiar with it. Yeah. So um, 
we all are familiar with our big kind of over the shoulder, whether it's the horseshoe one or a vest type of uh, personal flotation device. Uh, they also make some that are similar to like fanny packs and they're just like, they're like waist belts that clip around you and they're, they have little CO2 cartridges in them and you can pull them. Uh, so when you're waiting in, in a little bit bigger bodies of water uh, and you want that little bit extra protection, um, I certainly know friends that wear them and uh, just, just to be safe, it, it never hurts to be safe. Um, and kind of along those lines too. Um, so I wanna have a little bit more conversation about waiters. There's been a couple uh, questions that came in uh, for waiters and um, there's a number of different kinds of waders. You have what are called hip boots that are basically just cover your legs and they attach essentially to your belt. Uh, you can have some that are just a pair of pants, but you can also have some that are what we call chest waders and they are essentially go all the way up to your chest and they have suspenders on them and they pretty much cover you from your, your armpits all the way down. Um, and they come in what we call stocking foot and boot foot. Um, boot foot is essentially the boot is built directly into the waders and they're just generally a rubber boot. Sometimes they're felt and the stocking foot are, it's, it's kind of like that. Emma had said it in early in the presentation, they're neoprene booties that are attached to the bottom of the waiter. And then you buy a separate boot, uh, like a, it's a boot, it's a separate shoe that you goes on over that. Um, one thing that I recommend and, and personally that I wear, um, I like to have at least some small little metal studs in the soles of the boots that I wear. Some brands come with them already. Some of them have interchangeable soles. Some of them have spots where you can screw in uh, separately bought little metal studs that have threads on them and you use a little wrench uh, to screw them in. Uh, those have saved my butt a number of times from falling in the river. Uh, they just give you an added sense of security and I would highly recommend them. Also, along the same lines as the inflatable belt, um, always, always recommend a waiting belt. And I saw somebody put that in the comments too. Thank you. Um, wearing, when you're wearing chest waders, having a belt around your waiter, around your waist uh, will prevent water from filling up into those waders if you, if you uh, do happen to go for a swim. So that, that can be a huge, huge uh, uh, safety um, addition to your, to your little repertoire there. Let's see. Emma, here's one for you. Um, when you are fly fishing, what kind of indicators do you prefer for fly fishing? And, and when I say indicators for folks at home uh, that, that don't know what that is, when you're fly fishing and you're using uh, the nymphs or the wet flies as Emma was, was, um, was speaking to, indicators are essentially a, a bobber and it's, it, it's, they're generally smaller for fly fishing, but there's a bunch of different kinds. Uh, and Emma, I'll let you take the rest. Yeah, so I just tried to type this out um, into the chat. I don't know if it actually worked, but um, the brand that I use is the thingamabobber <laughs> brand. Um, and that's a type of strike indicator that you just loop into your line. Um, so you don't have to cut anything. You don't have to stick anything on. It just works for me. Um, and I know I've used the stick on um, one. So it's like a orange sticker where you put it on just part of your line and it floats. Um, and then I, there's also like the, like there's like yarn ones or there's um, like feathery ones that you can put on. Um, it's really up to you and how, like, like what works for your setup. I recommend the thingamabobber uh, brand because um, it's super simple, it's easy to use and you just loop it into your line. Um, the sticker ones are also really great because you just take them off, stick it right onto your line. Um, but if you search fly fishing strike indicator online, it gives you tons of options. Um, they also have a ton of them at your local retailer too. Um, you can ask them, hey, which one's cheapest? Which one do you like? Um, or what works in the water here? Um, so that's my two cents on that. Great recommendation, thank you. Uh, real quickly, uh, I had another question come in from the waiters and just asking what, uh, starting out fly fishing, what kind of waiters would be the best to buy? Um, my opinion, uh, I think it's, I always say don't go in the water if you don't have to. It's less opportunity for you to spook a fish. Um, but if you wanna get in the water and you have to, whatever feels comfortable and whatever is is within your budget, honestly, like like Emma and Kelly had said, there's this 
sport can be as um, as expensive or as cheap as you want it to be. And and most of the folks that I know started off with with either hip boots or or even just wet weighting, making sure you just have something that's decent traction on your feet. Um, you know, just something to kind of get you started. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Emma or Kelly, anything you want to add on on that? Uh, for that question specifically, um, let me see if I can try to find it. Um, but I think it also mentioned like, should I buy boots that are built in or should I buy waders and boots separately? And I, for me, what works for me is that I buy waders separate to my boots because um, it's like less of a hassle um, to try to move them around. And then also I can wear my boots separate from my waders. So in the summer, even if it's hot out, I wear my fishing boots in the river um, just as some sort of footwear in the river. So it's nice to kind of have both and then you can clean them individually or wash them. Um, but like Dan said, it's up to your budget um, and it's up to what you want to spend on it. Um, I know that Cabela's has a ton of different options. There's there's a, um, there's like the synthetic waterproof waders um, and then there's also the uh, actually not synthetic. It's just like the waterproof rain jacket kind of fabric. Um, and then there's also like synthetic neoprene waders where that's the entirety of the waiter. So it's really a good idea to go to the shop and like try them on because sometimes they fit weird, especially I would recommend for the ladies out there, try to get on your waders um, in person. It just helps. Um, and, uh, and try to get it to fit right because you don't want to be uncomfortable out there. Uh, so yeah. Good tip. Um, I had a question that came through about licenses and someone had asked, um, where is it here? If, uh, if my, my license, uh, can I use my license from one state in another? Um, and that's an interesting question. Um, Kelly or, or Emma, do you want to, uh, do you want to take that on? Um, I, I think Emma typed a little bit of an answer, but I'm, I'm pretty sure as far as like what I'm familiar with, I think that the licenses are state specific. Um, so in order to fish in a state, you have to buy the license of that state. Um, I th and I do know that in, in PA, and I think probably everywhere to encourage tourism and, and allow tourism, like tourist fishing, if you're visiting somewhere for just a day or two and you want to fish there, they have like, you know, like one day licenses or three day or you know, those type of licenses that you can buy. So you don't have to buy for the full year if you're only going to be there for a week, um, but you want to try fishing. So, but but yeah, as far as I know, that you have to have a license for whatever state you're going to be fishing in. Thanks, Kelly. And and I'll add to that too, um, a, a cool little note, because uh, I know that there are some folks uh, in attendance today from from bordering states from Pennsylvania and Colorado. Um, and And at least in Pennsylvania, I know that we definitely have uh, bordering waters. And if you have a Pennsylvania license, um, you can fish on this. It, as long as your state is bordering down that water, like you're legal to fish in that water. So for instance, in Pennsylvania on the Delaware River, as it goes up north towards Hancock, New York, and then it splits into the east and west branch, uh, I could not use my Pennsylvania license on the east branch because that's in New York, but I can use it for the entirety of when it borders, as long as the river borders and is on Pennsylvania land. I can still use my Pennsylvania license, even though it borders Pennsylvania and New York. Um, and again, it's always good to double check your regulations, but but what Kelly said is, is also as far as I'm familiar with, um, it, they're pretty state specific. Okay. Um, I don't really see any more questions that have uh, come up here. So I think- Can with I that, add one thing? Oh, sure. No, absolutely. No, that's, that's, I think, that's, that's okay. <laughs> I think the person who's asking about fishing license has also added, but if you fish with someone that has a license in that state, are you allowed to fish with them? Um, so like Dan and Kelly were saying, your fishing license only applies to one person. Um, so if you're fishing with a friend who, like, say, if I went to go fish with Kelly in Pennsylvania, she has a Pennsylvania fishing license and I can't be under it. So it's individual to your person. Um, and only you. And yeah, like Kelly said, you can buy like one day or two day. Um, it's not just your annual fishing license. So there are other options when you go online to try to buy it. 
Great. Had one more come in really quick here from Scott. If you're starting fly fishing, what is the best not to learn? Um, and I'll let the three of us take this. Um, I'll give my answer. I think the most important knot is is a clinch knot. It's what you tie your your tippet to your fly with. Uh, and if you don't have anything at the end of your fishing line, then you're not going to catch any fish. So I think that's probably the most important. Yeah, that took the answer out of my mouth because that's like that's my favorite one. <laughs> that's like the one that I use. I've learned some of the other fly fishing ones. But yeah, that's like the basic one that you have to know. And you can pretty much get by with it. Like it might not be the best presentation, like tying your your tippet to your leader and, and to your line, but it works. So if that's all you know, that's a good place to start. Yeah, I agree. The clinch knot and then um, like people can get really into their knots, but like Kelly said, it works and it works out on the water. Um, so I always stick to what I know and what works and what I know previously works as well. Um, I also like to do the surgeon's knot and the blood knot, super similar. They're pretty much all the same knots. Um, and then another good knot to just have in the back of your mind is the nail knot uh, connecting your leader to your line. Um, it involves a tool. Um, but just know that that's kind of the knot that you have to have if your line breaks off to your leader. Um, sometimes leaders, you can just stick it right on your line. Really depends on what you have, but another good knot to know. Uh, so here's another one that actually came in. Uh, and Kelly, this is a conventional gear question. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to this, but um, do you know much about uh, about power bait and like the purpose of power bait and the colors? Oh, okay, yeah. So um, the colors are essentially used to attract uh, the the fish, like make it very visible to them, so that it stands out um, and is easy for them to see. And I think power bait also has like a scent aspect to it as well when you put it in the water, because if you if you just dip it in the water, you'll sort of notice like you sort of see a sheen. Like that's kind of the stuff that's put in it to attract the fish to your lure or, or, or to your, your hook. And it's also formulated to like to stick to your hook better. So sometimes when you're casting with live bait, you, you can just fling it right off the hook. Um, but power bait, I think, is specially made to like stick to it. So even though you really kind of get it on there, it looks like a ball or, or maybe you can make it look a little bit like a worm. Uh, really, the, the purpose of it is to visually attract it and to scent wise also attract the fish. So power bait is not a bad option. Actually, I've had fairly good luck with power bait. Um, I know some people like, I don't know, they, they don't like it <laughs> for some reason, um, but really there's nothing wrong with it. it. It does attract the fish and it does catch them. And um, and there was one day that I was fishing with my best friend. Um, we were fishing at Black Michigan State, uh, State Park and um, we were just playing around, just having hanging out and having fun. We had all kinds of different setup with us. And the one thing that worked was power bait to, to catch chain pickerel. That's what they wanted. That's what they loved. And I brought them in. So it works. Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. That's a really good insight. So with that, it's, uh, it's right about 830 right now. So I think I'd like to, uh, to wrap up the event. Um, but I really want to thank everybody for, for being here. And uh, Emmett, can you, can you just adjust to the next slide, please? Because I want everybody to be able to see, there we go. Uh, I hope that you can all join us uh, next week, which is uh, Friday, May 21st, 7 p.m., where again, we're gonna kind of cover that trout biology, uh, some of your, your reading water and, and presentation techniques, and, and then as well as uh, some handling techniques from that. Um, and if you would like to reach out to Emma or Kelly uh, and ask some more questions, uh, their contact information is right there on the screen. But again, I hope you all got some great value out of this. Uh, and, and please, please stay tuned for the next couple of, uh, of Fridays. It's going to be a really great presentation or a great program. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. So uh, thanks so much and have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for coming. Yep, thanks. I hope this um, inspired you. If you don't already get out there and fish, I hope this inspired you to get out there and give it a try. Thanks for being here.